So the different types of waivers that the college um, decided to offer, uh, there were different types of groups. So the STEM really focused on the students who wanted to take these uh, science, technology, engineering, math um, courses. But we wanted to offer something for the new students as well. So the acceleration waiver was to incentivize those students who uh, were exempt from the CUNY assessment test to come to BMCC as a CUNY, as a, as a, as a BMCC community college, even though they were probably eligible to go to the senior college, we wanted to incentivize them and encourage them to enroll in the community college. So the students who had no remedial needs were, were put into this group. And I've also wanted to emphasize too, because the, the Eastern University of New York put a great deal of pressure on all of the colleges, both senior and community colleges, that they wanted incoming freshmen to perhaps start their academic career in the summer because the idea then is that they could accrue more credit somehow and, and advance more quickly. Um, we also wanted to focus on students who were getting close to graduation. We wanted to uh, sort of reward them for making it that far. Uh, some students will get very close to the end of their degree completion and see transfer in their sites and then transfer out early. So we really wanted to encourage students to finish at BMCC, especially for the students who may have to go part-time following semester just to finish up the whole course. So this enabled a lot of them to take their last course here and also um, get it at no cost to them for tuition. Um, the momentum waiver targeted students who were enrolled full time in the previous regular semester. This was in the summer of 2015, so students who were enrolled full time in spring um, had accumulated at least 12 points and had earned a minimum 2.5 GPA. That was the target group. And we made sure that the courses that they were taking would count towards their degree completion so they could get one step closer to um, earning that associate degree. I actually have to emphasize on this too because uh, for the most part, nationally, associate degree programs require students who earn 60 degrees to get their associate degree. If a student goes full time, you do the math very quickly. Uh, if the student's going to get an associate degree in two years, four semesters, that means the student should earn and complete past 15 credits a semester. But traditionally what happened is many of our students who going full time only took 12 credits. So part of the plan behind this too was to somehow then get the student into the track where they would be able to do the 15-15-15 to graduate in a timely fashion. Um, the Jumpstart Waiver was uh, for students who had completed the CUNY START program, which was a uh, sort of pre-freshman, um, we could also, it was a pre-freshman <coughs> program where students could get their remedial courses completed at low cost, it only cost them $75. So the students who took advantage of this, we wanted to uh, welcome them back into the main college and also to encourage and support them and tell them that, hey, you know, you can come and get your first credit bearing course um, completed through this tuition waiver program. Uh, the students who did the Jumpstart had to have successfully completed the CUNY START program. So we needed them to not only complete, but complete successfully by passing their remedial course. And before we also spoke about the STEM waiver, so we continue to offer the STEM uh, waiver program. So with all of these, um, all of these waivers here targeted all of the students who, at any level, were trying to take credit bearing courses. Uh, we also have in the summer and the winter a an immersion program where students can get their remedial coursework completed for free. But that's really a program for freshmen. So a lot of the time we're targeting students who have less than 30 credits. Um, so in order to help students who were struggling in completing their uh, remedial course, we also offered developmental waivers. And these developmental waivers were stu for students who had earned at least 30 credits and only had their very last upper division uh, remedial course to complete. Um, so the developmental waivers were offered in reading, oh, math, I did in alphabetical order, uh, reading and also in writing. So a number of students also participated in uh, this type of waiver. Okay. So um, we'll just talk to you now about how we did it. So a working group was formed once we started to actually uh, figure out how we were going to offer the tuition waivers to the students and also to select which students were going to participate. Um, the working group consisted of representatives from academic advisement, the bursar's office, the registrar's office, and student um, communications. And what was really wonderful about the working group, it wasn't just student affairs or academic affairs, it was really uh, a project where the entire college really worked on it together. Um, the Bursar also reports to administration, so it was really about everybody working collaboratively so that we could uh, have a 
have this successful program. And that's critical too, because so over the past decade or two, you keep hearing about how uh, areas operate in silos, and what you want to do is break down those silos. It's not student affairs, it's not academic affairs, but the partnership is what's critical to make everything work. Um, so one of some of the things that came out of these working groups, um, we created a website and a uh, response form so that uh, the students were able to see the information even if they didn't get a personalized letter from us. They could also submit a response form saying, I'm interested in this, please send me back more information. Um, so it was very transparent. It wasn't one of those programs where it's very hidden and people sort of have to go around word of mouth finding out about what's going on. Um, we also sent out a notice to the college community. We sent out notices individually to students, the faculty, the staff, advisors, everybody was aware of it. So it was a really comprehensive communications plan that really targeted every single group who was on the campus so that we could try to um, encourage students to participate. Um, we also used a lot of our existing technologies, and that's really what the main focus of this um, presentation is about when we selected the population. Um, because it's, this isn't a presentation about, oh, go out and get this piece of technology. It's talking more about how you can use the technology that you already have so that you can accomplish your retention goals. And then we also did some student tracking. Um, the student tracking we were able to do through some of the technology that we had um, through Hobson, which we'll also talk about. And then we also did some follow-up with the students, and we're going to talk about that more in the results piece of this. So um, for everybody who's from New York or in CUNY, everybody knows about CUNY First, and uh, I think that CUNY First sometimes gets a lot of negative press, but in our instance, what we used it for was so that we could select these students that we wanted to capture. Uh, we were also able to um, put a marker on the student's record in CUNY first so that historically we could go back and see which students we'd given the tuition we were to so that we could track and see whether or not them taking this course in the intercession made a difference in them graduating um, or persisting and it really gave us a lot of data. So um, for those who are familiar with CUNY first, this all looks very familiar. Hopefully it brings a smile to your face today and not any angst. We also used um, a BMCC reporting dashboard. So it's taking information from CUNY first, and then it's putting it in a way so that we can search for students very readily. Um, so with our dashboard, we can select you know, the number of credits that a student has earned, how many of the credits they're taking in progress. So that really helped us identify the students for the momentum. Um, we can also select students who have not yet completed remedial coursework. And that's one of the things that's sort of missing from the CUNY First um, system. So we were able to use all of these different systems together so that we can cap capture the population that we're looking for. Um, we also use DegreeWorks. Um, DegreeWorks provides information on the student's progress towards degree completion. Um, it's an, uh, an online degree auditing tool. And sometimes, depending on the iteration of DegreeWorks that you have, you'll see a little bar. So it'll show you how far along the student is towards their um, degree completion. On the back end side of it, for reporting, we can actually pull that information, you know, select the students who are maybe 80% complete with their degree, and that helped us select the students for the completion paper. Um, it's also very easy to read. The advisors can see what the student is looking at, so we sort of speak the same language and we can uh, help the students navigate the system a little bit better. Um, we also have the ability to search for students who are in particular majors. So trying to identify students who would take a STEM course is a little bit difficult because on the one hand you can pick the students who are in the STEM programs, but you also want to be able to pick students who just need to take STEM courses. So we could pick a lot of like liberal arts students and we could target them and say, have you ever thought about doing this field? Or we see that you were exempt from your um, remedial math placement. Have you ever thought about something other than a social science or something other than um, just a general liberal arts program? Uh, the other really great thing was we were able to target different classifications of students. So we could select lower freshmen, um, upper freshmen, lower sophomores, different things like that. Um, and we also used the uh, DegreeWorks has a really great reporting um, instance, so you can pull information that way. So uh, we used both of the all 
really all three of the systems degree works that the MCC reporting instance, and then also came first that we could select our student population. Um, with Hobson's, we were able to, this is part of the communications plan, uh, Hobson's will send out these very personalized emails to students. So this one was actually written to Erwin Long here, telling him that he's eligible for the tuition fee program if he was a student. Um, so it has interactive links. This system will allow you to see which students have clicked on the links. It'll tell you which students have opened up the email. So it, it provides a lot of analytics for the college, but it also um, enables you to say, hey, I saw that you saw that email. Like, how come you didn't respond to it? Or when students will say if they didn't get something, you sort of can, you know, there's a, a bit of accountability on both sides of it. Um, so this is kind of tiny. You can't really see it. but. You can get these really wonderful reports from it as well so that you can see which students have accessed it, how many um, students the email bounced back, how many didn't receive it, um, and different things like that. So we found all of this to be very, very helpful. Okay, so now for the fun stuff. Um, so we wanted to talk to you about some of the, the results of this project. Um, we found that, well, this is giving you information about the summer enrollment. As we spoke before, the very first semester that we did it was summer of 2014. <coughs> so you can already see that between um, the summer of 2013 to the summer of 2014, we had a significant increase in the number of students who enrolled in our summer sessions. So about 700 additional students registered, which is pretty fantastic. And this is to think that we only offer the STEM tuition waiver. So in our following semester, when we expanded the program, we offered all these other type of waivers, we had almost 2,000 additional students who enrolled. Um, so they enrolled in lots of different courses, um, not just STEM, they did their remedial uh, requirements, they did you know, humanities courses, really it ran the gamut, because with that momentum waiver, we really opened it up. We said, as long as you're gonna continue towards your degree completion, take any course that's gonna count. Um, so I think that that made a, a very significant impact on our summer. Um, there was also a report that was written by the IR office at the MCC uh, that really looked at the summer because that was one full cycle since um, we initiated the program. So uh, the quote says, in the summer of 2015, BMCC had its largest enrollment ever, with 8,347 students enrolled in various summer sessions. The increase over 2014 is 22%, which I think is pretty fantastic, um, or 1,488 students, a substantially larger increase than in the prior two years. Almost one third, so t over 2,300 students, claimed one or more tuition waivers. <coughs> and then we also had 374 students who registered for two summer sessions and claimed a tuition waiver. Um, so a lot of those students you know, were either completion student who would maybe put off taking their credit bearing math course, but were close to graduation. So um, this program was obviously a very big help to them. <coughs> Um, now, since we're at HETS, we wanted to show you sort of the breakdown of the ethnicity of students who would receive the waivers over time. So as you can see here, the Hispanic population was the second largest um, recipient as compared to their group of the tuition waivers. Um, but if you look here, which I think is very interesting, black non-Hispanic received the, well, had the largest number of students who were enrolled in the summer, um, or who had enrolled in the intercession, but a higher percentage of the Hispanic students were able to, cl to claim the tuition waivers. Um, so there were lots of different reasons why people couldn't claim the tuition waivers. Either they were repeating courses that they had previously passed, um, they were just taking some course that didn't count towards their degree, they were one of those students who habitually changed their major, and this happened to not be a course that counted, or it would have counted once they changed the major. Um, but we found that this was very interesting when we looked at sort of the ethnic breakdown. Um, we also looked at the passing rate uh, by the waiver type. So the students who didn't receive a waiver, they passed at an 84% um, rate. <coughs> the, but I thought what was really interesting was that the students who received the momentum waiver passed their courses at a 90% rate, which is, is pretty amazing. Um, the acceleration, and these are students who are coming in who are a little bit more prepared because they don't have to complete their remedial coursework, 
uh, they passed it at 82 percent rate. So all across the board, you can see that it was a very successful program. And even down here with the developmental waivers, it looks a little bit low at about 54 percent. But typically, when you're looking at the rates of regular developmental courses, I think the rate is around 40 or so percent. Right. With the developmental waiver, this is deceptive because uh, the reading and the writing usually it's, it's relatively high. In fact, we have one of the highest pass rates in, in reading and, and writing in the University of system. However, the number of sections offered developmental uh, mathematics is about three times as high. And their pass rate traditionally is maybe about 40%. And, and again, to mention mathematics is still a major challenge. So if you take into account that math is about 40% to see a 55% pass rate actually is significant if you include the mathematics. Right. And of the developmental courses that we offer during the intersession, the majority of the courses are always mathematics classes. Um, so all in all, we can say that this program was very successful. It may have been that the students ha didn't have to think about one additional thing. And especially with community college students, we know that they have a lot of sort of competing priorities. So knowing that you didn't have to find money to take this on our course may have alleviated some of their stress and enabled them to um, focus more on their schoolwork. Okay. Um, so we also had um, statistics on the number of graduates. So um, uh, what students did after they had completed um, summer program with the tuition waiver. So about 10% of the students who received the tuition waiver were able to graduate at the end of the summer 2015 semester. Um, we had over 1,500 students who participated in the waiver program but didn't graduate, but they were at least still enrolled. So we knew that they were persisting. Um, we had about 67 students or 3.2% 3, 3 of the students who participated in the program and then transferred to another um, college and obviously we don't want students to just transfer before graduation but at least they were continuing on in their education so we knew that they were persisting um, and then we had about 225 students who completed the tuition who participated in the tuition waiver program but then didn't enroll in the fall semester so all in all it's about an 89.2 percent success rate which isn't too so the summer tuition, the summer waivers program served uh, 2,080 individual students and helped lead to 215 end of summer graduates and 2,318 successfully completed courses by the MCC students. This is almost an almost 90% success rate in terms of completion and keeping these students pursuing further education. So all in all, we can say that the, the program was a success. some of the new students it's 
a little bit more difficult. A lot of the times when students were doubling, it was for the STEM papers and then some other type of paper. Um, so I think the program has been a big success and we're looking for different ways to expand the program um, and see what the results are. Really going to be. I hope the lesson learned too is that, again, you know, any way that you want to have students persist, you know, be retained versus graduate, you have to actually have a multi-pronged sort of uh, attack. It can't just be one thing that's going to do it. You're going to need several, and hopefully, all of these will be successful. And uh, continue to think outside of the box. Absolutely. And, and really, I think it's really important to say that it's not just about getting technology for technology's sake. You really have to have the manpower and the people who can use the technology in an efficient way that, that works for your institution. And also by getting a committee of people together um, who, who know what they're doing, what their pieces are, and making sure that everybody works collaboratively, I think that's really one of the main reasons why um, the program is a success. Because another thing too is that the technology here is not 22nd century sex. You know, it's, this is stuff that theoretically you currently have. So the idea is to take what you have and make it work for you. So uh, you may have technology or some sort of plan, and then again, getting the right people together to brainstorm and figure out the ways to make it successful.